Welcome back, Troglodytes, to the Troglies Guitar Show. Today we have a 1975 Gibson SG Custom today. Now, I don't know what it is about SG Customs, but I can never seem to buy one of these that's straight. There's always something wrong with these guitars. The first one I bought had a twisted neck, had to send it back. This one, hidden headstock repair, gonna have to send it back. But I figure, well, we might as well document it while it's here. SG Customs are incredibly cool. I do like them. I'm really familiar with like Les Paul Customs, so seeing those appointments on an SG, it's really interesting because I usually don't view an SG as a high-end instrument, but more so as just like a utility rocker instrument. So we learned the story of this guitar yesterday, and despite it having to go back, let's learn from this example. What makes an SG Custom different from an SG Standard of this era? Well first, the face of the headstock is different. You can see you have your custom emblem and your Mother of Pearl Gibson logo with binding and a truss rod cover that reads SG Custom. Now if you've been watching my channel, you remember this guy. We can use this to compare the two models. So a normal headstock on an SG standard will have the crown emblem and the Gibson logo like this. It does not have the binding along the edges and it just says SG on the truss rod cover. This one had the Schaller style on it, but you can also find some with Grovers. Whereas an SG Custom from the mid 70s will have what is called the Klusen Waffleback style tuners. Now these are incredibly fancy tuners. I absolutely love the way they look, but as far as functionality, I'm not a big fan of these. They kind of do this weird thing when you go to loosen the string. There's this kind of dead area where they don't do anything like this. Until you start turning them up, then they kind of lock in place. But again, as soon as you start to loosen them, it's wonky. And they're pretty much all like that. Next up, the SG Customs have the large block inlays. They take up most of the fretboard, really. But this is a great way to illustrate the point. The early 70 SG Customs, you can see how thin the nut width is up here. Just by looking at how much wood is on either side of each block inlay, that's a really good indicator of how it starts off smaller here, and then the neck gets a little bit wider and chunkier. These are really nice guitars. Some people like these profiles. Others, if you have large hands, can feel a little bit cramped, so they aren't for everyone. Now, SG standards in this era were actually offered in two iterations. There's the ebony fretboard with small block inlays without binding, and then there's the rosewood fretboard that has binding with the small block inlays. Now, the bodies themselves, as far as I can tell, they are the exact same. There actually is no real difference to them. I mean, there might be a slight contouring difference or something like that, but there's nothing major. It's not like on a Les Paul standard where you have single ply binding or a Les Paul studio where you don't have binding and then the custom does. Basically, the only difference this guitar has is it has a third humbucker in the middle position, whereas the standards do not have that. Now, SGs from this era have what are called super humbucking pickups. They're also called tarbacks. You either love them or you don't. I'm not a huge fan of tarback pickups. It's not that they don't sound good, it's just once they stop functioning, they're dead. You cannot fix them because the epoxy coating, you can't get under that stuff. And it seems it's becoming more and more common for these things to have dead coils in them, especially on 25 50th anniversary Les Pauls. Now those ones have coil splitting abilities and you can tell when a coil's dead because that coil split no longer works. Now these pickups, they're perfectly fine. They work great. They are original to this guitar. You also have your original harmonica bridge. Uh, let's take a minute to talk about this bridge. A lot of people don't like these simply because they're so large. However, from a setup standpoint, look at all this intonation room you have. These are beautiful bridges as far as adjusting your intonation. And you just have your regular stop tail piece on these guys. And your pick guards are a little bit different simply because you don't have the insert here because you have a third pickup. Control wise, stock, these things are very simple. In the upper position, you have just your neck pickup. 
The middle position is the middle pickup and bridge in a kind of out of phase sound. They're kind of stratty in that way, and that's why I like the standard three pickup Gibson. And then you have just your bridge pickup in the normal position. So stock, there is no way just to get like the middle pickup. But personally, I prefer that. Some people will rewire these to have three volumes where you can blend the middle one in. I hate that. I think that's more so for somebody who wants to do recording and get that exact sound that's in their head. For me, I like the simplicity of the standard three-way toggle switch, getting kind of a strattier sound and then the two sounds that you're used to. Now this one actually has some replaced parts. The two volume pots have been replaced. This one is with a Gibson pot, and this one's actually with a push-pull. You can kind of see it sticks up higher normally, but you can pull it up, and I have absolutely no clue what this is actually doing. I believe this might be an in or out of phase control. It only appears to do something in the middle and bridge position. So I'm not 100% sure what that mod was for, but it wasn't done too long ago, judging by this being a Gibson branded pot. So viewing an SG Custom from the back, you really can't tell the difference between that and an SG Standard. The only main difference is like the type of tuners that would be on it. Both of these have three-piece mahogany necks with a mahogany body. So would I suggest you check out an SG Custom? Yeah, I am a big fan of the early 70s SGs. There's some people that wouldn't even dare touch them. And then there's people like me that I've just fallen in love with these SGs. However, I think a lot of that comes from the very first SG I ever touched was a 1974 and I fell in love with that guitar. So definitely check one of these SG customs out. Would I necessarily suggest paying like three and a half thousand dollars for one of these? No, but if you can pick one up for, you know, 700 to 800 dollars more than an SG standard, I think at that point that's where they're really worth it. Now since this one's going back, I didn't put fresh strings on it, I didn't clean it at all, because in my experience it's better just to leave it alone if you're not actually going to end up keeping it, because some people are particular about what's used on their guitars. So I've only got five strings to play with on this one. I didn't even touch the tuning of this guitar, I would play it in some weird drop tuning. So let's go ahead and hear how this guitar sounds. Now that we know how this guitar sounds, let's go ahead and briefly look at the condition. The face of the headstock is actually in pretty good shape. When it did break, it didn't break through the top veneer, so you don't really have any eyesores on the front. So that's good. You have that characteristic mid-70s logo here. This is either a late 74 or a 75 model, judging on the two tone pot dates. Just a beautiful headstock here. Your truss rod still functions. You have your original SG custom truss rod cover as well. So besides some long strings and some dust, everything's looking good here.
Your frets do show some play wear on them. It's not a lot. It's just a little bit of flattening for the most part. You're missing a string and this thing badly needs a fresh set of strings. I mean, these strings are a little bit rusty and the fretboard definitely needs some attention. It definitely has some built up grime. You appear to have a three piece mahogany body on this one. You can see you've got some dings and scratches pretty much all over this guitar. It was definitely someone's player. That's probably how it got cracked at the headstock, but it is an excellent sounding guitar. I did enjoy this one. Everything on this guitar is original, except for obviously the missing switch tip and the two volume pots that have been replaced. You've got some tarnishing and wear to the gold hardware, but not a lot. So overall, the face of the guitar is very respectable and average condition. Back of the headstock, your serial number is 376194. It's really hard to see, but it is there. The one actually appears to have been dinged or scratched out. And then it almost looks like somebody scratched in a one on top of it. That way you could still see it. I don't think there's any tomfoolery there. That could have just been a ding and it's all a coincidence, but it is there and good to know about. And you have your Made in USA stamp as well. Now, whoever did this headstock repair, awesome job. I don't believe it was ever a complete break. It was likely just a crack. I mean, a pretty decent sized one. You probably couldn't still play the guitar, but at least it didn't break through to the face of the headstock. Now, can you feel it with your nail? Just barely. I mean, this is a very excellent repair. You can just barely feel it, but you can see that the finish was touched up. It's kind of a darker brown color here. Sometimes this is what the SG's original finish would kind of look like and they fade over time. So it's not too out of place, but it is definitely a touch up to the finish and a repair under there. Besides that, you just have some light nicks and dings on the neck, but nothing that really affects the playability of this instrument. Again, this is not a bad guitar. It just has a headstock repair and therefore that affects the value of it. Back at the guitar, you've got some buckle worming, some scratches and smudges. Most of this would probably clean up pretty good. And thankfully the neck joint, no issues there. You just have your typical line. And now we'll look at the sides of the guitar. You've just got some minor scuffs and dings. You still have the original strap buttons. That's pretty rare on these things. That's usually the first thing to go is the strap buttons. All right, black light time. Everything's looking pretty good on the front of the body. You can see the back is also in good shape. You got a little bit of area right here where the finish was worn through with the buckle wear. But as far as the body goes, you're in pretty good shape on this one. Take an extra close look at the heel joint. You can see that there are no breaks, cracks, or repairs to that. And that's kind of the important thing with an SG. Heel breaks are scary to me. Just handling an SG is usually scary to me because their heels are so weak in comparison to all the other Gibson offerings. Face of the headstock, looking good. It once again shows that there was no breakage to the headstock veneer. But unfortunately, once we get to the back, you can see that this has been repaired. Now usually it doesn't look quite this green. So that tells me this is a very old headstock repair. We're talking probably within five to 10 years of this thing being brand new. But you can see a distinct color difference between these two areas and how they glow. It's not a lot, but it's definitely present. And that's what helped me see the actual headstock crack line right here. You can see it bright as day under black light. So this is why everybody should own a black light. I don't care if you only ever buy one guitar you should just invest in it. I mean, the most expensive ones out there are 200 bucks, but the only reason why I have such a powerful one is because I have to take video with it. A simple $20 bar light one will definitely do you just fine for checking in person. So it doesn't pass the black light test as far as no breaks, cracks, or repairs, but we kind of already knew that. If you think you might be interested in being the next owner of this guitar, I'm not gonna be the one that's selling it, but feel free to contact me on my Facebook page, facebook.com slash T-R-O-G-L-Y-S. 
All right, Charlotteites, thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.